Hi, everyone. I'm Leanne West, and I'm the president of the International Children's Advisory Network. And I want to welcome you today to Ask the Experts, where sometimes the experts are clinicians and sometimes the experts are our youth members. Today, we are so grateful to have Dr. Simon available to talk to us about her work and experiences in the STEM fields. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to her and let her share a little bit more about what she does and help us get started today with a wonderful discussion. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I am Dr. Arlene Simon, and I am a biomedical engineer. I am calling in from the West Coast, specifically Oregon. So it's a bright, not so bright, 7 a.m. Uh, on a Saturday morning. So if it looks like I need a cup of tea, uh, it's most likely because I do, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm super excited to be with you today and share a little bit about my journey or my career path so far in biomedical engineering. So I'm going to share my screen. Actually, before and while I'm doing this, if I could get an idea on who is on the call today, uh, if you could type in uh, your age. If you're above 25 plus, you don't have to put your specific age. You can just say 25 plus um, and where you're calling in from. That way I can tailor my talk accordingly. And I, I don't want to use too much technical jargon if uh, folks on the call are primarily include, um, you know, kids under 12. So let me stop sharing or maybe uh, Amy, if you could tell me <laughs> what people are typing, because I can't see it. Absolutely. Um, so far, I think just Dr. Chang and I are 25 years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like to think so. <laughs> okay, awesome. And it uh, looks like we have a 13-year-old, Pujase is 13, and Abby just joined us from Omaha, Nebraska. Um, Abby, do you want to drop in your age, too? And just typically uh, within our group, most of our kiddos are in those teen ages. So anything from like that 12, 13 up to 18, that's the majority. So, and we do have exceptional members. So they're all very ready to get started. Oh, and Abby is 16. Thank you, Abby. Nice to meet you, Abby. The character in my book is called Abby. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I don't know how to get rid of this window at the top, so hopefully it doesn't distract too much. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a biomedical engineer, and today my talk is called Big Dreams in Biomedicine. Biomedical engineering is somewhat of a broad topic, and it basically applies to uh, using technology, specifically engineering technologies, to improve healthcare. And so it may span where you're creating technologies to understand a certain disease, or you may be creating new technologies to diagnose a disease, to prevent a disease, or to treat a disease. Now, during my career, I have worked in a few different fields. And this image or the slide here gives you a very high level overview of some of the areas or spaces I've worked in. So starting from the top left, uh, you see this image with um, a pipette tip and uh, a few like some liquid in some wells. Uh, we call this a microwell plate. And this may be used in certain laboratories where uh, you may be trying to understand what proteins are in a healthy person versus in a person who has breast cancer. And if that person has a lot more protein uh, because they're in a sick state or disease state like breast cancer, maybe the brightness uh, of the, the fluid when you look under um, a microscope at fluorescence, or if you're looking at uh, just the darkness of the liquid, it may more protein, uh, it's brighter, or um, if it's under a microscope for fluorescence. Uh, this sort of uh, picture here shows 
you see a lot of green little circles. And this will talk a little bit more in detail, but this was uh, part of my invention uh, work at University of Michigan, where we tried to create or improve upon a, a standard um, laboratory test and make it a bit, um, use less patient uh, samples, like less, less blood samples from patients. And so you're able to, to similarly uh, quantify how bright the spot is to let you know how much protein is present in a patient. And then I also uh, worked on a team where we were designing syringes. And you can see this little boy looking expectantly uh, at a nurse who is going to inject him with some medicine. And so as part of, a, as a biomedical engineer, I got to be able to design um, syringes. I also got to work in supercomputing. Now, supercomputing are really, really, really large computers. Sometimes they're so big that they take up the size of two tennis courts. And with supercomputing, just as I'm speaking to you today from a laptop, and sometimes my laptop may overheat, or you may have a cell phone or using your parents' tablet, and sometimes that device gets really warm. And there are fans in my laptop, for instance, that help cool, cool down the system. In supercomputing, I worked in a team of engineers where we were trying to figure out some creative ways to cool down the servers or large computer systems uh, in a supercomputer. And so that was one role. Um, I've also worked on uh, teams where we look at global health. Uh, so I got to work in Kenya a few times and really teach uh, lab technologists how to be safe when they're handling patients who have HIV or tuberculosis. Um, so that's what this photo here represents. And today I help design uh, medical imaging equipment uh, like ultrasounds. And so that's what this, this image shows here. Now, because I like inventing and I like creating new technology, I like using healthcare for good, I also write a children's book series called Abby Invents. And I know somebody on the call today is Abby. So this is another Abby. And so in this series, Abby invents things that kids wish existed, like unbreakable crayons um, and even folding machine to help her mom fold laundry faster. So for the purposes of this talk, of course, I won't be able to to go through all the areas I've worked in, and some of these are not even pictured here. And so today, what we're gonna focus on is a little bit about diagnostics, a little bit about designing syringes, and a little bit about how to design imaging equipment like ultrasounds. And at the end, we'll wrap up very lightly <clears throat> where I'll introduce you a walk a little bit more uh, to Abby and how she helps shows kids about inventing. Now, I want this to be interactive. So if there are questions, uh, then perhaps I won't be able to see you based on the way my screen is structured, um, but I'll ask Amy to sort of let me know if anybody has any questions and we'll take it from there. So I was born on a Caribbean island called Dominica not the Dominican Republic, uh, but Dominica. So when you see the word dominoes, Dominica, uh, distinct from the Dominican Republic. So it is, uh, the island has about 60,000 people. Uh, if you've seen the movie Pirates of the Caribbean, um, some parts of the movie were filmed there. So it's, it's very much a tropical paradise. So I was born there and I went to primary school, high school, uh, on the island and then I moved to the United States uh, to pursue a college education. Today I live in Oregon, so that's uh, shown here. This is that. Um, oh. is, is there a question? Okay. And today I live in Oregon. So in terms of my educational path uh, to 
get to where I am today. Uh, I went to school for a total of 22 years. Now that may look or sound like a long time uh, to some of you on the call, but I promise you it's not. I still feel like I'm pretty young. Uh, so uh, in the Caribbean, uh, we our education system follows the British system. So we don't say elementary school, we say primary school. And so uh, our primary school education is usually about uh, seven years. And then high school is five years. So this image here is not of me, but these are some kids who are wearing a similar school uniform to what I wore uh, when I was in primary school. Uh, in high school was when I developed a love for chemistry. Um, I just was just fascinated with the type of experiments we do in the chemistry lab where you're looking at different compounds and being able to uh, mix different chemicals together, see different colors. Um, that for me was really fascinating. And so when I entered college at Georgia Tech, uh, somebody mentioned that if you like chemistry and you like math, then you should consider a degree in chemical engineering. And so that's what I did. Um, I was able to do a few internships uh, during my time in college. And I realized that I actually did not like chemical engineering. What I liked instead was courses that had biology and biochemistry. And when teachers would explain that, you know, they're creating a new biomaterial or they're creating a new drug delivery patch and they got inspiration from a lizard and how a lizard feet, um, a lizard's feet allows it to walk uh, on walls and uh, it, it can walk on walls because it has the sticky adhesive on its feet. And, um, a teacher, a professor at Georgia Tech was able to draw inspiration from a lizard and be able to create a new drug delivery patch. You can think of it like a bandage and uh, using inspiration from the, the feet of the lizard, he's able to design the, the patch. That way when a patient administers that drug delivery patch on your skin, when they rip it off, it doesn't peel off your hair on your, your skin uh, like normal bandages. They, they use, they leverage the feature from the lizard. And so that type of work in biomedical engineering is usually called biomimicry, where you're drawing inspiration from nature. And so hearing conversations like this got me really excited. And I realized that I like um, the biology element to engineering. And so I decided to pursue a PhD at University of Michigan. Uh, and my PhD is in macromolecular science and engineering. Now I know that's a macromolecular sounds like a really big word, but if you break it up, macro is big and molecules, so big molecules. And specifically, since I was interested in biomedical applications, uh, these big molecules I used or studied and graduate school often had a biomedical application to it. Okay, let me know if you have any questions, okay? Uh, so today I am a biomedical engineer and an inventor. And so I design blood tests and medical devices. And so this is an image of me uh, where I work in my previous role when I was working in supercomputing. Um, so this is what it looks like in the data center. And this is an image of me when I was in graduate school at University of Michigan um, using pipettes to sort of pipette uh, different proteins or different uh, patient samples uh, in these little Eppendorf tubes. And so this is a typically what a lab environment looks like. Okay. Now, Wait, what... I have a, a quick question for you that just uh -huh. came in. And I think this is really interesting at this point in your presentation. Since you went to school for numerous years, how did you stay motivated to continue working towards your goals and not get burned out? And this is from Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so in high school, um, I had a really good uh, group of friends. We're still best friends today. I went to an all-girls high school. 
and there were seven of us in our, I guess, group of girlfriends. Uh, so we would often do our homework together. Um, if we didn't like a teacher, you know, we, we'd talk at recess time and figure out, you know, what can we do as a team, you know, to do our homework together? How do we raise our concerns to our teacher? What can we share with our parents for help? Uh, in college, in undergrad, for instance, um, physics was not my strong fort. And my dad is a civil engineer. And so when he saw me struggling uh, with physics, I remember he went to Barnes and Noble at, on his lunch break one day and he came home with a book, Physics for Dummies. And so I would study in my Physics for Dummies book on, on weekends to sort of try to catch up with my other classmates who were really, were much better at physics than I was. Now in graduate school, um, and I'll talk a little bit about it in, on a few more slides. In graduate school, you know, the work I was doing was technically challenging, very challenging, you know? And um, often when you are a woman or a minority uh, in science or technology, engineering and math, uh, there may be instances where you may be working in a lab environment where you're the only woman, you're the only minority, and you may feel sometimes like you don't belong. And, and so, so that also affects your motivation sometimes to wake up in the morning. You know, Michigan winters are really brutal. Convince yourself to get up, remove the snow from your car, go into the lab and, and do experiments. And, you know, you spend eight to 12 hours in the lab sometimes and the experiments don't work. And, you know, I really did. There were periods in graduate school where I really, really, really wanted to quit. Really, I was really close to giving up. And what helped me there was, again, my parents sort of reminding me, remember in high school when you were struggling with a math exam and you thought you were going to fail, but you studied really hard. And then at the end of the term, you end up getting a B or an A. Remember that? Or my friends saying, remember in at Georgia Tech when you had, um, you know, this new course in chemical engineering or you were doing physics and you thought you were going to fail, but your dad got you this book and you just had to practice some more and it turned out okay. Well, maybe even if you're facing this new challenge with your experiments and yes, you've never done, you know, working with big molecules, but similarly, if you find a team of classmates who can you can do your homework together. Um, you take a break from homework. You guys go out, you go to a park, you relax. Um, these types of things sort of help you um, stay motivated in graduate school. And having mentors like my PhD advisor, when he saw that I was struggling with a, a, a certain part of my experiments, you know, I remember going into um, his office and just saying, you know, hey, professor, I don't know if this is working. I've tried so many experiments and it feels like everything is failing. And his feedback to me that day was, you know, Arlene, maybe you're not asking the right question because, you know, remember sometimes you have to do something 9,000 times and then it's like 9,999 times. That's when it worked. Um, and so science is all about grit. It's about having a passion to do something and having the perseverance to stick it through. And so there will be many times when you wanna give up, but you sort of have to surround yourself by good friends, uh, good mentors, uh, read inspirational quotes, read books, uh, look at YouTube videos of other people who share their struggles and how they were able to power through. These were things, and these are still things I do today um, in my career, when I want to give up, I still go to YouTube and watch inspirational videos from Goldcast. It doesn't have to be about scientists, but even actors and um, fashion designers, whoever's story is inspiring to me. And most of the people that you see today who are successful have gone through lots of challenges. But, but what is a common theme between them is that they have a passion and even if they encounter obstacles, uh, they don't give up because the urge to quit is always strongest 
when you're closest to the finish line. So chances are, more than likely, if you feel like quitting, if you just give yourself just one more push, you will be fine. Now, I hope that answers your question. This may have been a bit longer, <laughs> longer winded, um, but in a nutshell, that is how I was able to power through 22 years of school and still power through my engineering career today. Thank you. And by the way, that was Abby. She's using her mom's computer. So it shows up as Rebecca, but we know now it's Abby. <laughs> and she is very grateful. Thank you very much. You're most welcome, Abby. <laughs> um, okay, so we spoke to this slide. So journey to innovation. Um, so typically, if you're in elementary school or high school, uh, you may be introduced to the engineering design process uh, in this format, not necessarily this image, but these main steps where it starts with asking a question. Um, and when you ask questions, you know, being very curious, you ask questions, you may realize that you've identified a problem that not many other people are thinking about. Um, or maybe people thought about the problem, but they weren't brave enough to ask the question. Uh, so once you've identified that problem, you know, by your curiosity asking, you start imagining or brainstorming solutions, right? As you brainstorm, you may start getting your pencil and paper and draw out what it's going to look like. And you start planning the materials that you need to build whatever widget that you think is going to solve the problem that you've identified. Uh, once you've collected all your materials, you're going to create it. So you're going to create a prototype. And now that you have your prototype, you have to test it. Uh, chances are your prototype, it's not going to work the first time or the second time. So you have to iterate on your design. You improve on the design. And once you have a design that you are satisfied with, then you have to remember to revisit the problem that you're trying to solve and ask yourself, does my invention or does the widget I build, uh, does that solve the problem? And so engineering design process is very cyclical and it has that notion of empathy. You always have to think about who is going to use my device or what, is it an animal? Um, you know, it can be humans, animals, you may be working with cells. Uh, the entire spectrum. And so you always have to think of who is gonna use my device? What are they using it for? Okay, so um, before I show the slide, in graduate school, I started learning about more about cancer. And cancer patients, sometimes they may have to get chemotherapy. Chemo chemotherapy, however, isn't specific to cancer cells. And sometimes when a person gets chemotherapy, which is just a cocktail of different medicines that doctors hope will make the cancer patient feel better or heal them, uh, these medications may not just kill the cancer cells. Sometimes they kill um, the healthy cells as well. And when that happens, the cancer patient may now have to get something called a bone marrow transplant. Now, a bone marrow transplant, the purpose is to sort of replenish the healthy cell supplies of the patient, right? Um, in a bone marrow transplant, you may get the bone marrow transplant from your friend, you know, from a parent, from a stranger. And there may be times when that person who donated you the, the bone marrow transplant, that bone marrow is rejecting your body. Um, and it creates a disease called graft versus host disease. So graft meaning from the donor and host meaning you, the patient. And so what happens is your body wants to fight this off. You know, there, there is some, it's not necessarily a mismatch. It's just your body recognizes this being as foreign, just like when you get a cold and, you know, you're, your neck feels warm because your, your body is trying to fight off that illness, right? Um, so it's similar in this cases with graft versus host disease. Now, 
as an empathetic engineer, you know, sometimes you say, okay, so a person has cancer, they get chemotherapy, then they get a bone marrow transplant, now they get a graft versus host disease. Is there anything that I can do as a biomedical engineer that makes this step a little bit easier to cancer patients? Now, what we learned was one way that doctors diagnose or detect when a patient has graft versus host disease is the person may get the skin rashes, right? And to confirm that that person has graft versus host disease, the doctor may, have, may use a biopsy. That's what you see in, in this uh, image right here, which may be a little bit painful. And so the question that we asked was, can we create an easy to use, non-invasive, meaning that you don't have to um, you know, poke someone with these biopsy needles, as a way to detect graft versus host disease. So that is, brings in the engineering design process of asking a question, right? And now comes understanding more about the science. So how can you detect when there are different proteins that get elevated or their levels increase when a person has this illness? When a person has this illness, they may have, you know, let's say, 80% of the purple proteins, 5% of the red proteins, 1% of the green proteins. It becomes some sort of a mathematical model. It won't just be one protein that gets released um, because they have that illness. And so in biology, there are other proteins called antibodies, and that's that Y shape that you see here. And they may have certain regions in that protein that bind specifically to the purple protein or the purple antigens, or they may be designed to only bind to the green protein. And the reason I have these Lego images here is because, you know, if you've played with Legos, um, you know that how they're designed is they may attach to, um, depending on how the Legos are, are shaped, uh, you may be able to attach uh, different Legos to each other, or sometimes you have, um, you know, like a person Lego, which may not bind to these Legos shown here. And so that's similar, a, a certain analogy that you can use to think of how antibodies and antigens uh, sort of connect together. Okay. So the challenge from a technical perspective is if it's true, that a person who has graft versus host disease or they have lots of different proteins that get elevated, but we know that there may be some mathematical model of how much red protein, how much blue protein, and we wanna quantify how much red and how much blue so that the doctor can tell the that that person really has graft versus host disease. Now, if we use the technologies of today, how it works is you may have, you know, that antibody, that Y-shaped uh, capturing protein that I just spoke about. Uh, you may add it to a plate or like a petri dish kind of. Um, so you add it to the plate, it binds to the plastic uh, surface, and then you, you wash it, you wash off the excess as if you're washing dishes, you wash out the excess. And then you take a sample of the patient's blood, um, you process it in such a way to collect the plasma, which has all these proteins that are elevated. You allow that to bind to the Y, you know, the capture antibody. And then you wash away the excess. And then if you now introduced a second antibody and that second antibody has um, a tag that makes it light up because you want to quantify how much red and blue. So the more light for the red, you know there's a lot more red. If there's less light for the blue, you know there's less blue. If we were to mix the red and the blues with the, the tags and then we wash, sometimes you get false positives, meaning a red and a blue uh, detection antibody may bind to the red 
protein. And so now you're seeing double brightness and you may think, oh my God, you're really sick. You have so much red protein, but you really don't. It's just you have two antibodies binding to the same protein. Or you may have a case where the red antibody accidentally bind to the blue protein. And that's because they may be not specifically designed um, to target the red protein, which gets a little bit complicated. But the purpose is here of making it simple. The red protein may not, may bind accidentally to the blue protein. And so now you're telling the patient, oh my God, another red, you have so much red in your body. You're definitely sick. And now the doctor needs to give you this new medicine which may not be true. And so as a way, again, in graduate school, thinking macromolecules, big molecules, I worked with uh, these two polymers, uh, polyethylene glycol and dextran. Just like in your kitchen, you have oil and water, right? You know how oil, if you add oil in a glass and you add some water, the oil is gonna float to the top, it phase separates. This is very similar in this case where the polyethylene glycol and the dextran, they phase separate. And because they do, we're able to trap proteins in the dextran phase and solve the challenge that I just spoke about. So what does that look like? I'm gonna to try to keep it really simple. We're able to trap the two different Ys, you know, the antibodies, the two different Ys, the antibodies I spoke about, in these droplets of dextran. So we're able to trap only the green Ys together, only the black Ys together. And then in the top solution, think of it like uh, how your oil floats, right? So in the top solution, we mix that with the patient sample and we allow for one hour so that the proteins which are elevated in the patient blood they diffuse into the droplets. And when they diffuse into the droplets, only the green protein binds to the green antibodies. So the green target with the green, they match, same thing. And then after an hour, we come back with our pipettes and we introduce another droplet that just combines to the first. And that droplet has a bead. This is where we're introducing this bead. And now the bead is designed to bind specifically to this antibody. Once it binds to it, there is a chemical reaction that causes uh, singlet oxygens to move over to this Y and it, it lights up. And it only lights because these uh, sandwich uh, of antibodies and proteins of interest are within a few nanometers apart. If they're far apart, they would be, it would be too far for the oxygens to travel, there would be no light. So because everything is trapped in these droplets, we're making sure they're able to find. And so now we're able to read a signal uh, that tells us how much green do you have? How much black do you have? And we can feel confident that we won't accidentally get the false positives I spoke about where a green, like you know, the wrong antibodies bind to the protein. Now, let me know if that's complicated. I tried my best to make it simple. That if is you have a question. So yeah. yeah, and we have another question coming up here. Mm -hmm. um, Pujase just said, if chemotherapy is killing healthy cells and making the patient need a bone marrow transplant, which also makes the patient face another problem, why do we still use chemotherapy as a treatment? That's an excellent question. Well, so chemotherapy does have lots of benefits. Like I personally have had uh, folks in my family who have had different forms of cancer and who undergo chemotherapy to make them, and that help them feel better, right? Uh, so it doesn't mean that all patients who get chemotherapy have to get a bone marrow transplant and get that disease. So it's very much like a funnel. 
uh, there is a space in a science called uh, personalized medicine, where the notion is, you know, the medicine that works for me may not work for you. And that's because our, our genetics are different. And since personalized medicine is a field that's still advancing, the best in class uh, technologies or solution that we have today that really helps cancer patients is chemotherapy. Now for different patients, uh, the medicine that they receive in chemotherapy may be different. Because if you have breast cancer, the cocktail of drugs that you get for breast cancer may not be the same as you get for ovarian cancer or prostate cancer. And so chemotherapy does have its benefit, which is why um, typically physicians advocate for early cancer detection, where you get, if you're a woman, you get your mammograms um, early enough that they're able to detect uh, the cancer early. And so one of the beauties of biomedical engineering is that you will have some engineers who focus on creating better diagnostic tests, ways that we can detect cancer early. And then you have others who are focused on developing treatment. How can we um, offer or create the best type of, of, of treatment uh, for patients? Um, so, so chemotherapy is beneficial, uh, but with science, science is all about discovery. And so there is always going to be, like with the engineering design process, there is always room for improvement. And so there are people who are trying to make chemotherapy um, more better, right? Where they are able to design drugs that specifically target cancer cells versus cancer drugs, which are not targeting um, a cancer cell in particular. And then at the same time, there are people who are developing better chemotherapy drugs. And in my work here, it was more of a funnel. Some people get cancer, then some get chemotherapy, then some get um, the bone marrow transplant, then a few get graft versus host disease. So it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one matching. It's very much a funnel. I hope that answered your question. Um, so the solution or the invention of the technology that we created, the way we thought about it would be, again, can we make it simple and non-invasive? So we thought with a very small volume of blood, if we're able to mix it with one of our polymer solutions, and now you have all these elevated proteins diffusing into these droplets, and you know we know for sure what antibodies are in each droplet so we can tell, you know, this is the red protein, this is the blue protein, and based on the brightness, we can quantify the levels. Now, it was really cool because then under the microscope, this is what it looks like, where, you know, the droplet where we have the antibodies trapped, and then this would be like a bigger droplet where you're mixing with the protein. And so it rehydrates, which I'd never seen before. And so that was, for me, one of the coolest videos I got to take during graduate school was being able to see two uh, solutions uh, that being able to have one droplet rehydrate because I eyed another. And so it feels very much like water and water, uh, rehydrating water, so to speak, because the, the percentage of polymers in the solutions are so small. Uh, the majority is water, it's like 90% of water. And so for me, that was really cool. And so that resulted in uh, me becoming an inventor. And so these are um, two of the patents that I have around different elements of this technology. Now, I want you to pay attention to the date that's circled here. Um, I think this relates again to Abby's question, you know, about, uh, how long it takes to complete something and you know, how do you not give up? So the date when this invention was filed was 2011. The date when it was accepted by the United States Patent and Trademark Office as an invention was 2016. So see, I'm showing you all of this in like a few slides, but it takes a long time 
to create a technology. And after you create that technology, it takes a long time as well for lawyers and patent examiners uh, to review your application because you're not the only inventor. There are many people inventing too. And so you can imagine a stack of inventions that a team of experts have to review um, to make sure it's, it's really something new, um, something that solves a problem, uh, something that can be used. So again, I really have no idea how to get rid of this thing. So again, success does not happen overnight. You know, many people view success as uh, you read something, you have this idea, okay, voila, did it, done. But really success is a windy path. Um, you know, you have, you get an idea, you try it, it fails, you wanna give up, you put it aside, you walk away, you take a vacation. While you're on vacation, you, an idea comes to you while you're walking through a park and you're like, oh my gosh, if I go back to lab next week, I can try this, maybe that will work. Whoops, it didn't work, try something else. And so it's a very much of a winding path to success. And so the importance is really not giving up. Now, what else can a biomedical engineer do? You know, this was diagnostics. Again, it's all about applying engineering to solve problems in healthcare. And I'm realizing I'm almost out of time. Okay. Um, so you can design new medical devices. It could be targeted drug delivery, like we spoke about, maybe uh, with cancer drugs, you're able to make them specifically bind to cancer cells. Uh, you can design prosthetics. You can do medical robotics, like this help a surgeon, um, you know, see uh, using robotic arms to do a surgery. Uh, you can also do genomics as well. So you can do lots of things. Um, I think for the purposes of this, because we only have a few time, I will just focus on syringes. So in designing a syringe, a syringe is a deceptively simple device. Syringe has like three parts. You have this barrel, it's like a cylindrical barrel. You usually have like a black rubber material at the plunger tip. And you have a plunger and then you have a needle. It looks really simple. You know, you go to the doctor, you get an injection. You may not even think about how a syringe works, right? Sometimes syringes are used manually by a nurse or a physician. And sometimes it's used on a device called a syringe pump, which has like a, um, a rod, so to speak, that sort of moves the, the plunger tip slowly to deliver a certain amount of drug over a time period. In practice, there may be times when you have a baby who's a preemie hooked up to all these machines and then you think about science, you think of gravity. How long is it going to take for that drug to go down this tube? How many um, connections are in this, in this baby? Are nurses sure that everything is being delivered at the right time with the right amount of drugs? How can we design devices to make sure uh, that they're error-proof? Okay, so the question here is, can we design syringes? that deliver the right amount of drugs to the right patient at the right time. Now, I know from my personal experience, when I was in high school, I would sometimes wonder, you know, when do you use math? Like, why, why is math important? Where in my career am I ever going to use mathematics? Well, if you are familiar with the equation for calculating volume, Volume, you know, is area by length. And the volume of a syringe, because it's a cylindrical device, this is the mathematical equation, pi r squared by length, where r is the radius of the syringe. You know, the, the perimeter, so to speak, is the diameter. And the radius uh, would be a, if you draw a line halfway through, right? That would be the radius. So, um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so for mathematics here, uh, it's important. What we learned when I was working on this team is 
you know, we, we, we make lots of syringes. They come in different sizes, a one, M, one milliliter, five milliliter, 15, mil, 15 milliliter. And sometimes nurses, when they're really, really busy, uh, they may grab the largest size, the 50 milliliter, fill it up with, with, with medicine for a baby, right? But because the baby is small, the baby may only need one ml total in say like an hour or something. As an engineer though, if we don't talk to nurses, we think that maybe the nurse is going to grab the smallest size syringe, the one ml to give one, one milliliter. That would make sense because you would get it in an hour, but maybe the nurse wants to deliver one ml over an entire shift, maybe an eight hour shift or 12 hour shift. Now, when we're looking at syringe pumps, it's all about you know this little plunger or rod sort of moving slowly down the, down the path of the syringe pump. And where the math is involved is if I have a 50 milliliter syringe, like a really large syringe, and if this is the um, if this is the the internal diameter of the syringe, and this is the speed 0 0.06 milliliters per hour that the nurse enters into the syringe pump, it means that over an hour the syringe is only moving 0.11 millimeter. Now, as an engineer being able to design a device that moves that, that short distance in an entire hour, it may be very difficult because there are going to be errors, right? That distance is not much larger than the size of the human hair. And so as a biomedical engineer, it's important that we listen to nurses and the people we design devices for to understand how they use it. That way, when we design the devices, we can engineer elements in it so that it doesn't cause these errors. So one thing that we could do, or and some uh, engineers have done, is if a nurse puts a 50 milliliter syringe in a syringe pump like this, he or she will not may not be able to set the speed that low because we know as engineers that may not be accurate in how much drug that the patient could actually get. So maybe it only allows a nurse to enter something, enter one milliliter per hour as the limit. And she or he cannot push the down arrow to select a speed that's, uh, that's um, slower. And that would avoid um, some of these technical challenges uh, that we see here. Now, there are other challenges with syringes. You know, uh, a doctor or a nurse or, you know, may have lots of different medicine that they want to put in the syringes. So maybe green, so maybe yellow, so maybe um, not as viscous like water, so maybe like really viscous, you know, like honey. Not, not that drugs are like honey, but in giving you an idea of differences in viscosity, how honey takes a long time to drop. There may be drugs that are you know, between that levels of water versus something that's a little bit thicker. And so a syringe is just one device. It has to be compatible with medicine of different thickness. Medicines have different chemistries. And so regardless of the chemistry, we want to make sure that the materials that we use for the syringes, nothing leaches into the drug because you you don't want anything harmful uh, to be included in the, the, the syringe material for anything to accidentally leak into the drug. We also have to think of ergonomics. You know, I'm very petite, but there may be some doctors who used to play football when they were in college. And so they're much bulkier, their hands are bigger. And so how do we design a product that allows that is just a one size product, but it can be used easily by petite nurses versus, you know, football player looking physicians. 
um, when you design syringes, you know, you manufacture them in different plants. And so you have to think about the, the quality control. How can I make sure that the syringes produced in Oregon, for example, are just like the syringes produced in Argentina? And so that's quality control. And then you also have to think of regulatory requirements, right? Um, if I'm going to sell, if I'm making a product, manufacturing a product in the United States, can I sell it in Mexico? And vice versa, if I make a product in Mexico, can I sell it in the United States? What are some of the, the standards and specifications and, and regulations that I must ensure I have in my design to make sure that where I manufacture something, if I manufacture it in a different location, I can sell it somewhere else. Any questions so far? Any other questions? This is so interesting. And I know looking at syringes, sometimes that can be tricky to see the hash marks and to know exactly on those teeny tiny doses how much to give. So mm -hmm. I love that you asked others who were around you for their input and knowing how to best make something. I think Maya, did you have a question? Did you want to share anything? I thought I saw her unmute for a moment. Okay, um, Dr. Chang, I also wanted to take a moment because I know we're getting close to time. Did you want to add anything in too? No, I was just thinking it's an amazing story. Um, what, what you've accomplished with your career is uh, I'm sure self-fulfilling, but also I think uh, society benefits from your work. So um, we should definitely congratulate you on everything you've done and who you are. And what a great role model um, for all the young people that are listening today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chang. <laughs> thank you. So because we only have five minutes, I'm going to skip the part about medical imaging, which I know that's what I'm doing today, but you know. And let's talk a little bit about Abby, um, just because we have a few kids on the call. Um, so because I became an inventor and I wanted a way to encourage other kids to know that, you know, inventing is possible for people your age, I wanted a way, a very creative way and a very easy way uh, to make kids see that inventing is possible and you don't have to wait until you're grown up like me to become an inventor. And so that is the premise uh, behind Abby Invents, a girl inventor who invents things that kids wish existed. So let's take a look at how the engineering design process could be applied for something that does not exist today. So in Abby Invents the Foldybot, the question Abby asks is, okay, mom, there are washing machines to wash the clothes. There are dryers to dry the clothes. Where are the folding machines to fold the clothes? And so as with the engineering design process, Abby and her cousin, Nico, they ask, people in the neighborhood, hey, do you like folding clothes? And they're like, no, it's, it's so boring. It takes forever. And so you imagine if dryers turn wet clothes into dry clothes, washing machines turn dirty clothes into clean clothes, how can I turn a folding machine, how can a folding machine turn unfolded clothes into folded clothes? and they plan out their experiments. So very similar to how I discussed in my career where you plan, and it's similar to what your teachers tell you about engineering, it's the same concept. And so now you plan, you study the washing machine, you study the dryer, what buttons are on these machines? Well, maybe you need a size button because maybe sometimes your parents are only folding one dress shirt, but sometimes they may be folding a gazillion. Maybe you want to fold faster or you want to fold slower, you know, depending on your clothes are silky or something. Do you need temperature? Probably not because the dryer already dried the clothes. 
And if you look, if you go into your laundry room or when you go um, you know, doing laundry with your parents, you'll notice that there's always a start button to begin washing or begin drying. So that's their planning. And then you have to draw out your idea. So maybe you need a size button, you need a speed, you need to start, but how are you gonna fold the clothes? And that is where innovation and imagination comes from. Uh, in the story, you know, Miko remembers that his dad is in the army and sometimes his dad doesn't fold his clothes a traditional way, but you can roll your clothes. And so the idea comes, well, maybe you, are, you can put a rod to roll your clothes. And just as I explained, when you do your tests, the prototype does not work the first time or the second time or the third time or the 10th time. They're gonna fail a lot of times before their prototype works. And just as in engineering where you always improve, they look at everyday objects like a pen and they notice when you push a button on your pen, the tip comes out, you push it again, the tip comes in and they start to think, and that's where invention comes in where you look for inspiration in other areas of your life and your world. And you try to see if you can take a concept, in this case from a pen, to put it into a machine to make a foldy bot. And so that is the premise. And so then they get a patent. And before you get a patent, there are three criteria that you have to ask uh, to make sure your idea is, is patentable. The first question is, is your idea the first of its kind? Has anybody done this before? No, so it's the first. That means, okay, check. Is it useful? Am I solving a problem? Yes. Is it easy to guess how you made it? No, then you can patent it. And so that is the premise of inventing innovation in a very simple way for kids to understand. And that is the end. And I think we're right on time. So if you have any questions, maybe I can take one more and then we can wrap up. This was so inspiring. I just have to say, I am thrilled by it. And I love this because I think it speaks to our ICANN youth members and how innovative and uh, novel in their approaches that they are for thinking and dreaming and coming up with these wonderful ideas. It's just so lovely. If we want to get your book, where could we do that? Um, right here, avinvents.com. Awesome. Awesome. I think this will be a wonderful thing to share and we will definitely put this up on the website so we can help inspire lots of future minds and in their innovation journey. It looks like Maya said, thank you so much. I loved learning about everything you do. Karen wrote, thank you, exclamation point. Abby wrote, thank you so much. So you have a lot of fans over here. Uh, Jesse just wrote, thank you. Uh, and Thank Dr. Jay had to leave a little bit early, so he wrote in his uh, gratitude as well. Um, and certainly, if we have any more questions, you can reach out to me, and I'll make sure I send them over to Dr. Simon, so Amy Omer at ICANResearch.org, and we will definitely follow back up with you. Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you, so everyone, for joining, and it was nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye.